All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Scientist to Go. My name is Eowyn, and I'm an educator at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Uh, today for our um, session, we are gonna start with a 20 to 25 minute presentation from Kirsten. And then um, as you guys have any questions that occur to you um, from a presentation, please go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, send it directly to me. Um, you'll see my name on there is Eowyn. Um, and then I'll be able to um, read those answers out when we move into the next part of our um, session today, and that will be our question and answer. And so if you send those questions to me, I'll be able to read them aloud. Um, and if anyone is having any technical difficulties or anything as we're going, please also just go ahead and put that in the chat and I'll do my best to assist as I can. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on over to my friend here. Awesome, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay. Let's see if I'm getting the right one. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So let's go. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kirsten, and today I'm going to be talking about phytoplankton, shellfish, and biotoxins in Maine. Um, and while all of these topics could be their own presentation, I'm really going to be focusing on the phytoplankton side of things. So a little bit about me. I have a bachelor's degree from Colby College, which is in Waterville, Maine. Um, a bachelor's degree just means that I graduated from a four-year college. Uh, you don't have to go to a four-year college to do science or be a scientist. Some people do less school, other people do more school. This was just the right decision for me. And while I was at Colby, I majored in environmental science with a focus in aquatic science. And I didn't always know that I wanted to go into science when I was younger. I did really well in my English and writing classes. But even though I didn't do as well in science classes, I had a lot more fun and I really liked getting to go into labs and do stuff with my hands and kind of make things and also getting to do research and ask a lot of questions and do a lot of critical thinking. And I chose to study environmental science because I really like being outside and I wanted to have a job that would let me go to new places and do things that I might not be able to do on my own. And some research that I did prior to working with biotoxins, I used environmental DNA or eDNA to examine epizootic shell disease in lobsters in the Gulf of Maine. And I also worked on the seagrass net database. I did data management and curation on the longest running seagrass survey in the world, which was pretty cool. And now I work for the Maine Department of Marine Resources or the DMR um, in the biotoxin monitoring program. And I help track and monitor harmful algal blooms in Western Maine. And we define Western Maine as from Kittery, which is about the New Hampshire border, to west of the Penobscot, which is kind of like the Sears Port area. Um, so talking about phytoplankton, what are phytoplankton? Plankton are what we think of as drifters. They're organisms that are carried by tides and currents and can't swim well enough to move against these forces. So they're kind of at the mercy of the ocean. And phyto means plant. So similar to plants that we have on land, phytoplankton use photosynthesis um, to help exist in the ocean. And phytoplankton is also referred to as microalgae. This will make a little bit more sense when we start talking about harmful algal blooms. And some phytoplankton are able to produce biotoxins. And these are the phytoplankton that I am primarily interested in and that I primarily work with. And we call these HAB species. Um, and biotoxins, if you don't know, is just a to toxic substance of biological origin. So in terms of HABs, the biological origin is are the phytoplankton. Um, and to the right is just a picture of one of our sampling locations that we collect phytoplankton from in Harps Well. So what are HABs? HABs are stand for harmful algal blooms, and this is the rapid, often uncontrolled growth of algae that can cause harm to people, animals, or the local ecology. Um, and something really important to understand is that not all HABs are biotoxin blooms. Um, so 
Red tide is a really common habit mane. You might've heard of that one before. That is a biotoxin bloom, but the name is a little bit misleading because most of the time you can't see this bloom happening in the water. Um, these pictures that I have on the bottom actually taken by one of my coworkers. He got to go up in a plane and fly around the coast of Maine and take pictures of some of the visible algal blooms that we see in the summer. Um, but these ones were not biotoxin blooms, um, but they're still considered harmful. Um, the rapid growth of phytoplankton can deplete oxygen from the water column. We talked about how phytoplankton use photosynthesis and one of the key chemicals that go into photosynthesis um, is oxygen. And so uh, when these grow really fast, they can deplete um, oxygen from the water and can create what we call hypoxic conditions. And this can cause death of fish, um, marine plants and algae, um, shellfish, coral, and other aquatic, aquatic plants. And these visible algal blooms also pose economic threats um, as blooms can impact fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism. Um, most track blooms do not have marine mortalities associated with them in Maine and are gone in a matter of weeks. So the blooms pictured in these photos had no associated die-offs and moved um, away naturally. So I talked a little bit about shellfish in the introduction and how do phytoplankton and biotoxins interact with shellfish. So this is what we call the intertidal zone. And that's the space of the shore that a lot of you have probably played in before. It is covered up by water at high tide and exposed at low tide. Um, and there's always lots of phytoplankton floating around in the ocean um, at all times. These phytoplankton that I have in the picture are not harmful um, and they help, they feed on nutrients and contribute to a healthy environment. And we also have shellfish in the intertidal zone. So this can be mussels, European oysters, soft shell clams, which are just a few examples. Um, and so they um, are covered up by water at high tide, which is when they do filter feeding. Shellfish feed themselves by filtering through water. Um, and um, yeah, they filter through water, which is how they feed themselves. And so sometimes when we're under the right conditions, we can also get toxin producing phytoplankton in the water. And these include phytoplankton from genuses like Alexandrium, Pseudonychia, and Dinophysis. And while not all species of these phytoplankton genuses will produce toxins, some of them will. And those toxins go into the water. And while our shellfish are filter feedering, they're also taking in all of those toxins. And phyto and shellfish can filter a lot more water than you and I could ever drink in a day. So these toxins can bioaccumulate in the shellfish pretty quickly. Um, different shellfish can accumulate toxins at different rates. So mussels pick it up really quickly. Um, in oysters and clams, it takes a little bit longer at higher concentrations. Um, so the shellfish are for the most part pretty okay. Um, they aren't affected by the toxins in them, but these toxins in the shellfish become an issue when humans harvest them for consumption. Um, and the toxins cannot be cooked out of shellfish and cannot be tasted in shellfish tissue. So if people consume toxic shellfish, they can get pretty sick. Um, and depending on the toxin that's being produced, the effects can be pretty serious. So shellfish tissue testing is required to ensure public health safety. Uh, my lab also does tissue, um, shellfish tissue testing, um, but I'm just talking about the phytoplankton for today. So how to monitor for HABs? We use phytoplankton sampling as an early warning system. Um, so using that kit that we have a picture of in the bottom left-hand corner, um, we take 10 liters of surface water in a bucket and we filter it through a 10 micron mesh that's affixed with, that is affixed to some PVC pipe um, and we use this as a filter. And that's because we know we're only looking for specific phytoplankton at a certain size. So we can help filter out some of the smaller guys that we don't care that much about. 
And then we flip the uh, filter over and we'll filter uh, the mess with some backwash using 15 milliliters of seawater. And that's what you see in the test tube um, in that center picture. And then we take that test tube back to the lab and we'll fix the sample, which means we just put preservatives in it and we'll look at it under a microscope. Um, and so this early warning system um, is kind of similar to some other early, early warning systems that you might use in your day-to-day -day life. So I think it's pretty similar to a smoke detector where when we're monitoring the water, a smoke detector is monitoring the air. When we see high concentrations of certain phytoplankton, um, we kind of, that sets off alarm bells for us and we start to focus on that area. Um, and that might mean more phytoplankton testing. It could mean some shellfish testing. Um, kind of depends on what phytoplankton we're seeing and in what quantity we're seeing these cells. Um, and so that's the same thing as a smoke detector. When they detect high um, quantities of something in the air, in that case, smoke, it will set off an alarm bell. And it's not a perfect method. Um, sometimes a smoke detector will go off and there isn't a fire. Someone might have burned popcorn in the microwave. Um, and that's the same thing for us. Sometimes high um, concentration of toxin producing cells doesn't necessarily mean that um, there is going to be toxicity in the shellfish, but it helps us target our monitoring to more specific areas because we do cover such a large portion of the coast. So one of our main uh, phytoplankton that we're concerned with is Alexandrium species. So Alexandrium can produce a super powerful saxitoxin that causes paralytic shellfish poisoning or PSP. Um, and this saxitoxin is really potent and really dangerous. Um, within hours of eating contaminated shellfish, people can develop gastrointestinal distress or neurological symptoms um, that without treatment can lead to death. And the species that we see here in Maine is called Alexandrium catinella. Um, and he's what we call a dino, armored dinoflagellate. Um, so it's kind of that uh, clear transparent shell, um, what we call fecal plates on the outside um, of the cell is the armor. And it also has this distinct girdle, which is that kind of waistband or cut into the sides that you can see about halfway up the cell. And then there's also that kind of dip in the um, bottom or the um, antipex of the cell. And what's difficult about Alexandrium is that it has a lookalike species. So the lookalike species is called Scriptiella. And these are two really zoomed in photos. So the differences are pretty clear, but we don't always get that same view when we're looking at it under the microscope. Um, and so the main difference that we use to uh, tell Scriptiella and Alexandrium apart is that kind of bubble at the apex or the top of the cell. And that is a pretty good clue that it's not Alexandrium, it's Scripsiella. And Scripsiella isn't a toxin producing species. So we're not that concerned with it. However, we have also recently started seeing high quantities of a species of Scripsiella called Scripsiella precaria. And this uh, species looks a lot more similar to Alexandrium. Um, it doesn't have such a pronounced bubble, um, but we usually tell the difference by seeing uh, a more conical shape. So that picture all the way on the left, it's a little bit more uh, ovular or like oval shaped than the Alexandrium picture all the way on the right. But uh, it can be so really hard to identify. So when we're looking at the cells under the microscope, oftentimes we have to look at a lot of different um, samples. So we try to move pretty quickly. And usually I spend around 20 seconds um, per grid on the microscope slide. So the next slide is going to be a picture. I'm going to give you all 20 seconds to see if you can pick, uh, pick out what you think might be an Alexandrium cell. Okay, so there's a lot of other things on this slide than just the cell that we're concerned at, but the cell that I would 
likely be most concerned with is this guy right here. Um, and I would probably classify it as Alexandrium. It's a little bit ovular. Um, and this one was a pretty tough um, little test for the first slide. Um, but you can see that fertile, the kind of waistband. Um, I don't see any bubbles at all. And it's relatively circular. Um, it's not at the level that I look at them at. It's not a super exact science. Um, when you have a really intense microscope, you can get a much better picture. But at this level, um, I always like to err on the side of caution because it is a pretty dangerous um, species. So I'll give another example. I'll give you 20 more seconds to see how many Alexandrium cells you think you can identify. Okay, so this one is a little bit tougher. Um, the two cells that I would really take some time to look at is going to be this guy in the left, bottom left, and this cell that's kind of hiding with a couple of other ones. Um, I probably wouldn't consider um, this one on the left to be Alexandrium. It's the girdle isn't super pronounced, um, and it's very very circular. Um, and then this cell right here um, in the top right, I would probably classify it as that. It's kind of tough because it's hiding behind some other things on the slide. Um, so you can't get a good look at the tip. Um, when you're actually under a microscope, there are some things you can do to help identify it. It might be like tapping the stage of the microscope to see if you can get things to move. Um, but you can see that really pronounced fertile, um, the kind of dip and the endope endopex of the cell. Um, and like I said, I like to err on the side of caution because there are some pretty harmful side effects. All right, I think I have two more of these. So I'll give 20 more seconds and see if you think there's any Alex on this slide. Okay, so as you can tell from the difference between the slides, some slides are a lot more productive or busy, so it can get kind of difficult. Um, the cells that I would be suspicious of is this one right here and this guy. Um, and that first one on the left is kind of shedding its shell. Like you can see that really big kind of bubble um, on the other side. And sometimes that happens Phytoplankton are not always the same shape or size every time. Um, but because I can't really see the girdle that well, um, and it's very circular and the shell is kind of coming apart, I probably wouldn't count that one. Um, the one on the right is could be Alexandrium. Um, you're not always going to get a perfect view. I probably wouldn't count this one. Once again, you can't see a super defined girdle, but sometimes the phytoplankton can flip and turn themselves around. So you might get like a side view or not the same view that you're gonna see in a guidebook. And one last one, 20 more seconds. Let's see if you can do it. Okay, so the three of concern would be this one in the bottom left, this one in the top left, and this one in the top right. Um, and the one on the bottom left is a really good example of Alexandrium. It's super circular. You can really see that girdle, um, and I would definitely count that as a cell. Um, the one on the top left, I wouldn't count. There's it's a little, it's not perfectly shaped, but there's not really much of a girdle. And this last one, I definitely wouldn't count. It's pretty ovular and there's no other really defining features to it. Um, so another phytoplankton that we um, really look out for is called the Pseudonychia. Um, and species of Pseudonychia can produce domoic acid, which cause amnesic shellfish poisoning. Um, amnesic sounds like amnesia. 
and people who consume shellfish with um, demoic acid can develop gastrointestinal symptoms um, and serious neur neurological symptoms as well. And there are many species of pseudonychia in the Gulf of Maine and the toxin producing species that we see here is called pseudonychia australis. Um, and pseudonychia is kind of the burnt popcorn of the phytoplankton. Sometimes we'll see really high counts, um, but we can't always identify it to the species level. Actually, we can't identify it to the species level. So we'll test the shellfish and a lot of times um, it will come back with no toxicity. Um, and this is what we call a pennate diatom. So you can see this large cell uh, with pointed ends and two symmetrical chloroplasts. Um, and as I just said, they cannot be identified to the species level with the sim simple light microscopy that we use. So we separate it into two classes as a large cell, which has a width greater than three micrometers and a small cell group, which has a width that's smaller than three micrometers. Um, and kind of similar to the Alex, it's not, when you're looking at things, um, not super up close. Um, sometimes it's hard to get an exact reading. So it's better to be consistent um, than you know, spend super long time trying to measure out every single phytoplankton that you see. So what this looks like under the microscope that we do, um, as you can see, this is a super productive slide, um, but you can see the large pseudonychia that's much easier to identify. You can see the chloroplast, you can see the ends connecting together. And then the pseudonychia is small, which is almost hair-like um, and it's really tiny. And pseudonychia also does have a look-alike species at time called skeletonoma. When skeletonoma is really big, it's very easy to tell that it's not pseudonychia, but when it's really small, sometimes it can be really difficult to see because the chloroplasts and pseudonychia are so small at the small level. So I'll show another slide and see if you can pick out the pseudonychia on it. Yeah, so the pseudonychia, this guy uh, right in the center, um, it's pretty easy to see in this slide. There's not a lot of other plankton on the slide and you can see the chloroplast really well. Um, the other phytoplankton on this slide are, is likely skeletonoma. Um, so as you can see, at, when they are at big widths, when they're wide, <laughs> um, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two. And the last species that I'm gonna talk about today or the last genus, is dinophysis. Um, dinophysis can, produ can produce okadaic acid, which causes diuretic shellfish poisoning. And I bet you can guess what the symptoms of DSP is. Um, and so the most common uh, dinophysis species that we see in our monitoring efforts is dinophysis acuminata and dinophysis norvegica. And some other uh, species that we see are Dinophysis tripos, Dinophysis forti, Dinophysis acuta, and Procentrum lima. And Procentrum isn't in the Dinophysis, it's obviously not a Dinophysis, um, but it does cause DSP and we do see it in Maine, so I wanted to include it. Um, and similar to Pseudonychia, not all Dinophysis species produce okadaic acid. So they can be kind of like burnt popcorn as well. Um, and these are all the species up close. So on the left-hand side, that is um, Dinophysis acuminata and Dinophysis norvegica that we see a lot of. Um, D. norvegica and Dinophysis acuta can look kind of similar, um, but Dinophysis acuta has kind of like what I would call a nice butt to it. You, it's much more rounded. Um, and Dinophysis acuminata and Dinophysis forti can also look kind of similar. So um, it takes a while and a lot of practice to uh, be comfortable identifying these under the microscope. And Dinophysis tripos is one of my favorite phytoplankton because it's super easy to identify and we don't see it that often. So it's really exciting when we do. And then the bottom right is Percentrium lima. Um, and so this is what the Dinophysis looks like under our microscopes at 10X. Um, you can see some Pseudonychia in there as well and a bunch of Dinophyses just kind of floating around. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot easier to see compared to the small Pseudonychia or the Alexandrium that has a lot of lookalike species. 
And for my last slide, um, I'll give you another 20 seconds and see what um, harmful algal bloom phytoplankton do you see here? Okay, so the first one that I'll point out is what we just talked about. So there's a bunch of dinophysis on the slide. That one is Dinophysis accumulata. Um, and we also see some small pseudonychia here. Um, and it's those thin little hair-like hair strands. Something else that you probably saw was this that looks pretty similar to pseudonychia. Um, I would probably mark that as skeletonoma if I was looking at this slide. There, if you have a small screen, you're not going to be able to see it. Um, but there are these teeny tiny dots in between um, what might look like chloroplasts. And so when you see those dots in between uh, what might look like a small chloroplast is a sign that it might be a skeletonoma. But it's really small. And like I said, I usually count things I'm not certain as a harmful algal species just to be extra cautious. Um, and the last one that is not Alexandrium. I just threw that arrow up to confuse you. Um, but yeah, it can be kind of difficult when you only have a short time to look at the slide and there's a lot going on. Um, so just some takeaways. Um, phytoplankton can be pretty difficult to identify. It takes a lot of practice um, and a lot of scientists do it at different levels. So we do it, um, we don't have like super big electron microscopes, which makes that more difficult. Um, if you have a higher power microscope, you can get a better picture of phytoplankton, but it's going to take a lot longer to get that picture. Um, some species of phytoplankton can produce toxins and some species cannot. And we have both in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and lastly, an algal bloom can be considered harmful without producing biotoxins. And these are just some pictures of places that I've gone um, and a shipwreck that I got to see while I was working. Um, like I said, I like being outside and getting to go to new places and I get to do that in this job. So yeah, that's the end of the slideshow. Excellent, thank you, Kristen. So let's uh, start our question and answer section. So um, one of the early questions I got was, how many Alexandria do you need to see in a sample to like start to be alarmed? Mm -hmm. So we see one cell, um, we send out what's called a target cell alert, um, which means that we um, are definitely going to get another phytoplankton sample. Usually we'll start testing shellfish as well, um, but that kind of depends on the time of the year. If it's like super late into the winter or it's really uncommon to see that species, we might just get another phytoplankton sample because it has a higher probability of being Scripsiella. But at this time of the year, we start sampling mussels. Okay. Um, one student asked, how do you get rid of them? Um, they just go away naturally. Um, yeah, they the plankton are, are drifters, so uh, different things they'll just clear out eventually. Okay, how do you test shellfish if they have it? Yeah, so we will go out and we'll harvest shellfish, um, and we bring them back to the lab, and we kind of blend them up, um, and we use what's called high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC. Um, to test the toxicity. And so we'll take the shellfish meat and then we'll know how many, um, I think it's micrograms per liters um, is in the shellfish itself. So if there's only one Alexandria in a shellfish, can you get sick? Um, I am not sure. I think it would depend on how much toxin it is producing. Um, that's a good question, I'm not sure. Okay, cool. Um, another student asked, uh, how do you, or how big are these different, like, phytoplanktons, like, if you're looking at them without a microscope? Oh, you can't see them without a microscope. Okay, so they're all teeny tiny. Mm -hmm. All right, um, and then another student, or uh, another attendee asked, um, if you could explain what eDNA is and how you collect it? Yeah, eDNA is environmental DNA, so that is DNA that is floating around um, if from marine environments, I'd be in the water. So um, you probably could get environmental DNA um, 
like in your bedroom, if somebody was to take a swab on your dresser, like you're going to have fingerprints or your own hair. Um, so that's DNA that you're not getting off of like a person or a thing, but is in the environment. Um, and so we, when I was doing uh, research with lobsters, we were just swapping, swabbing the carapace, which is like the top shell of the lobster. Okay, cool. Um, what is the biggest type of phytoplankton? Um, out of all the plankton, I don't know. Um, out of the ones that I work with and see, Dinophysis, usually Dinophysis tripos, shows up the biggest under the microscope. Okay, cool. Uh, why are phytoplankton so small? That is a great question that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would venture a guess that it has something to do with their adaptation so they can spread out further because they're small. Maybe something to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, they can, uh, I would guess, I'm not sure about this, but probably too, um, they can grow to be different sizes, probably based off the nutrient availability. So my guess would be if you're higher up and closer to the surface of the water where you're getting more sunlight, it would probably be easier to grow and get bigger than if you're towards the bottom where there might be less sunlight and less nutrient availability. That makes sense. Um, do they reproduce constantly? They do reproduce um, constantly. There's a, a lot of phytoplankton floating around in the water, so they reproduce often. Um, when you're in a bloom condition, phytoplankton are growing really, really fast and uncontrolled. So that I would probably consider and call um, rapid reproduction, um, but we also don't see it. So um, it might they might not be reproducing in main waters, but they could be in other places. Um, there's definitely a seasonality in the cycle too when we see particle species. Okay. How do they make the water change color? Um, that is a good question. Um, I don't do as much with non-harmful species. Sometimes it can just be um, like what the phytoplankton, phytoplankton themselves are. They might be producing something else in the water as well. Um, if you're seeing um, sure, if you're if they're uh, creating like anoxic conditions and you're causing a chemical change to the water, that would probably change the color as well. That would be my best guess. Um, but I don't totally know the answer to that one. <laughs> That's okay. See, guys, scientists don't quite know everything. They pick a thing, they know a lot of about that. And then once you get further, it gets a little harder to know everything. <laughs> um, so I kind of wanted to ask a question. What got you interested in phytoplankton to begin with? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I came from working with uh, seagrass, which was really interesting. Um, and I like working with shellfish. Um, I, it was a little bit by luck, to be totally honest. Um, I had been working remotely doing more data analysis um, and there was a job opportunity to work with biotoxins. And I thought that sounds really interesting. Um, and I wanted to do more field work and be outside. And that really pulled me to that, to this job opportunity. Um, and once I learned that biotoxins are caused by phytoplankton and started to do more work and get to um, learn more about phytoplankton and look at um, the communities under the microscope, I just became a lot more interested in it. Um, and it's such a big part of what goes on in the ocean all the time. Okay. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that you didn't know you wanted to be a scientist when you were little. What did you want to be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't think I knew um, at all. Um, I think I've been really lucky where I've tried a bunch of different things and I've been able to figure out what I like and what I don't like. Um, and I like reading and writing, but I didn't like doing that in like an English context, but I also get to do that in a science context. Um, so sometimes doing what you don't like can help you figure out what you do like. Um, yeah. Would you be able to taste phytoplankton? No, <laughs> not at all. You could uh, likely drink like a cup of water that had some harmful phytoplankton in it and not get sick, but because phytoplankton um, like if you accidentally swallowed some seawater, you'd be okay. But because uh, shellfish specifically can filter 
so much water at such high volumes, um, then it becomes a lot more dangerous and you can't taste it in the shellfish. That makes sense. Do plankton or phytoplankton have organs? Organs? I don't think so. I think they have, um, they're unicellular, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so they have structures inside of them, but not organs like people do. Wouldn't the chloroplast be like the closest thing to an organ? I think so, yeah. I don't because that's what makes the chlorophyll, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it's yeah, um micro I guess. Yeah, I don't think it's called an organ, but it's kind of similar. Okay. Um, do you 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 shared some pictures at the end of cool places you've gotten to go? Have you traveled at all for your job? Yes. Um, I get to travel all the time. So we do field work from the New Hampshire border to west of the Penobscot. So I can kind of be anywhere within that range, which is about a four hour drive from the top to the bottom. Um, and we followed the blooms. So we go where the blooms go. Um, so this past week I was in Harpswell or this last week um, and in Southern Maine. Um, and we also go down east and I've gone to take the ferry out to Final Haven and North Haven. Um, and DMR also has boats that we operate and go out on. Um, and we can be um, in a bunch of different Casco Bay, Muscongas Bay. Um, yeah, we cover the whole coast, the western half of the coast. Okay. Where did you grow up? I'm from Massachusetts. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, I have one more question about plankton. Um, do they eat or phytoplankton? Do they eat? Um, so they, um, I believe, get most of their energy from photosynthesis. Um, so they eat sunlight, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> yeah, they're just Not like in plants. the same way that um, like a shark or a fish might prey on another creature. Yeah, you can think of phytoplankton more like a plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, how many species of phytoplankton are there? More than I know about. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yep. I have no idea, but a lot. <laughs> All right. So as we wrap up, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, what is your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job is getting to go to different parts of the state um, and see a lot of different areas that I wouldn't get to see otherwise. Um, some of our sampling locations too are on private property. So really getting to go places that maybe one or two other people um, and their families would get to be. Um, yeah, and I get paid to do it. So that's a plus. Yeah, excellent. And what are you most excited about in your field right now? That is a really good question. Um, I think something that's really exciting is that uh, a lot of people are becoming more aware about harmful algal blooms. Um, in some other states, like Florida, they're really, really bad. Um, and so that's bringing more public attention to them. Um, and so um, I think having other people interested in what you're doing, and uh, like when I'm out sampling and having people come up and asking questions, um, is nice and getting to talk about my work with other people is always really exciting. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and actually that was even my final question, but I have one more really good one that was just asked. Um, are blooms changing with Maine as the climate changes? That is a great question. Um, so there is some evidence to suggest that they are. Um, there was a paper published, um, that suggested that Pseudonychia bloom, so that was the long pennate diatom um, with warming waters were going to decrease in uh, Western Maine, which is the area that I work in, and increase in Eastern Maine, uh, which is Issa Penobscot up to the uh, Canadian border. And there was also a paper published by um, a scientist at Bigelow Laboratory that looked at a time series of, the, of Casco Bay um, that had seen increased dinoflagellates um, yeah, over that time series. Um, so they're really hard to predict and it's not always um, easy to see long-term trends, but there is evidence to suggest that those trends could be happening. Cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right. Well, thank you so much 
for joining us today. I'm going to turn off our recording.